Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. We've got a new class this week, Required Minimum Distributions. Uh, a lot of talk about these, not only from the changes at the beginning of the year, but also uh, the ability to skip this year's required minimum distribution, uh, which is helpful. So we'll dive right in for a quick, uh, easy class on required distributions. For those of you that are new to our classes, the Foundation for Personal Financial Education is a 20-year-old nationwide nonprofit organization. Whole idea of this organization is to be able to provide education without the bias and sales that we see going on in all the wonderful dinner seminars and all the other uh, sales events you're exposed to out there. So hopefully you utilize what you learn in our classes and work with your CPAs, financial advisors, attorneys, whoever it is that you need to work with to apply any of this to your direct financial situation. None of this is, uh, is direct financial advice. It's just for education, general information. So be very careful how you utilize it. All right, so let's dive right in. Required minimum distributions. The first question is, is what parts of your portfolio are subject to these required distributions? And uh, it can be somewhat simplified by just saying anything that you have saved and never paid taxes on. So all of your IRA, individual retirement accounts, uh, your SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, KEOG, solo 401ks, those are all primarily self-employed plans there. Then you've got the work-based plans that are 403Bs, 401ks, 457s. These are all work-based savings plans that, uh, that, that you get to save pre-tax, uh, at least typically, although there are some uh, Roth versions of these that get confusing. Pension programs. So the true pension programs, that's actually IRA money. Uh, when you retire, a lot of you get options of taking a cash lump sum. You can roll that into an IRA and then you're subject to required distributions. Um, but you also have pension money out there that has to be triggered by 70. So you will have to take uh, um, the, the payment system by now actually 72. Uh, you'll have to actually trigger that income. And then many profit sharing plans can be pre-tax. Uh, and here's where the caveats come in. So subject to required distribution, if you are no longer employed by the employer that holds a Roth 401k, if it's still in 401k status, even though it's Roth, if it's in 401k status, it is subject to required distribution. So just know when you retire or leave a company, it's a good idea to roll over your old 401k money uh, into your own Roth account or your own IRA account so you have full control and you're not subject to different rules. And then anytime you inherit money from a Roth account or a pre-tax IRA account, meaning all of these other ones, if you inherit money from a non-spouse, a father, a mother, a cousin, an uncle, a sister, a brother, whoever it is, if it's not your spouse, you are now subject to a 10-year distribution. There are no controls on what you take and when you take. You can wait all 10 years and take it all out at once, which you typically want to do with Roth, or you want to put a plan together on how and when you're going to take it out. If it's IRA for tax reasons, you want to avoid taking it out all at once. So this is what you are subject to required minimum distributions. Now the phases of life uh, have changed. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we, we changed, tweaked a little bit because we're all living longer. And so they moved to the required distribution age out. So early distribution is still considered anytime before 59 and a half. You'll be subject to penalties if you take money out of any tax deferred accounts. Regular distribution, 59 and a half to 72, meaning you can take as much or as little money out as you want. And then required distribution after 72. And again, the caveat is if you inherit money from a non-spouse, if they don't care what age you are, you've got to start taking out. So required beginning date. This is where a lot of people will go cross-eyed, although they did simplify it by eliminating one of the halves. 
the half year. We never uh, understood why they did that other than to make it more complicated. So based on the individual's collective balance of pre-tax money on January 1st of each year. Okay, so they will base your required minimum distribution on the total of all your pre-tax money, all your IRA money on the beginning, the value at the beginning of each year. So technically all the custodians report the values of your accounts to the IRS close of stock market on December 31st. That is the number that they will use for the upcoming year's required minimum distribution. So I say it's the value of your money at the beginning of the year, but it's based on your age at the end of the year. So if you have a birthday halfway through the year, it's your age at the end of the year that they will use to calculate your required minimum distribution. We now only have two tables to calculate your required distributions. There used to be three, but with the new inherited uh, rules, they eliminated one of these charts. So using the uniform table for most people, but if you do have a spouse more than 10 years younger than you, then you have a separate required minimum distribution table because they account for the fact that your money has to last uh, for your surviving spouse life as well. So they reduce your required distribution. So there is a big advantage to people that have spouses more than 10 years younger, you will have a smaller required minimum distribution. So there's one of your, uh, one of your ways you can uh, manipulate the system. <laughs> And then uh, for anybody that inherits IRA money uh, or Roth money for that matter, it has to be out within 10 years. So that is the new rule on inheriting money from a non-spouse. If uh, you are a spouse and inherit it, most people uh, in most cases assume it as their own, but there are some other uh, things that you can do. If you still have 403B, 457, Roth, 401K, so, uh, so forth and so on, especially that Roth 401K, you do have to be careful. They may be subject to separate calculations and separate withdrawal rules. So please look at these before you reach 72. It's very important. Uh, a lot of people ask, well, why should I roll my money out of my 401K into an IRA? Well, there's no taxes, there's no penalties. Uh, you can invest more freely in more investment choices, um, but also you want to do it simply because of the fact that uh, you want to gain control and not deal with separate rules for each account. Because the IRS doesn't care how many accounts, they just want you to take X amount of dollars uh, out and pay taxes on it. If you fail to take a required distribution, uh, the penalty is steep, so be very careful on those. And then required minimum distributions cannot be converted to Roth. If you are over 72 and you are taking your required minimum distributions and you don't need the money, you can't take it out and put it into a Roth account uh, that is not allowed. I have met people that do it uh, and have not been caught yet, uh, but the IRS is very clear that that is absolutely not allowed. And at some point they will catch up to you. And then um, spouses can roll Roth or IRA money into their own accounts um, if they inherit it from a spouse. So just understand that um, when you inherit IRA or Roth money, if you are a spouse, you're subject to separate rules. You can just assume the money as your own and deal with your own required minimum distributions. Um, and there's a few other choices, but they're for obscure uh, uh, events that may um, come up in a few situations here and there. Uh, but for the most part, when you're a spouse and you inherit IRA and Roth, most people end up just assuming it as their own for simplicity. All right, first day you have to take your first required minimum distribution. Simplified a little bit, but still cross-eyed. So April 1st of the calendar year, after the calendar year in which the participant reaches 72. So that's a mouthful. So in my examples here, if John is born 1230, 1944, he turned 72 on 1230, 2016. 
and 72 in 2016 means his first required minimum distribution is not due till April 1st of 2017. Okay, so problem is, is every, every required distribution after your first is due within the calendar year. So by December 31st of each year. So if John in this example waits until April 2017 to take his first required distribution, that technically was 2016's required minimum distribution. He still has a second required distribution due in the calendar year of 2017. So the IRS has had this leniency for the first required minimum distribution that allows you to flow into the following year. But every year thereafter has to be done within the calendar year. So we do have to be careful about this leniency. And I always tell people, um, just take it in the year, the calendar year that you turn 72, okay? This used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72 just take your first required minimum distribution in the calendar year you turn 72. Don't wait till the following year. The leniency is simply for people that forget and maybe your tax purse, tax preparer person catches it and helps you remember. So don't typically wanna take advantage of this because then you're getting taxed on two in one year and you don't wanna do that, okay? If the participant is not retired, and 72, and as long as you're not 5% owner or more of the company, the required minimum distribution from your 401k at the active employer, you do not have to take a required minimum distribution. So that's uh, trick number two. If you want to manipulate the system, go back to work, put all your IRA money in the 401k at the company that you work at, and you will not have to take a required minimum distribution until you actually retire. And it's the April 1st after the year after uh, you retire. So, so that is one way to avoid taking required minimum distributions, but I don't recommend it because who wants to work for the rest of their lives? Now, non-spouse inherited Roth or IRA required beginning dates technically was the December 31st of the following year after the owner's death. So if you inherited it last year because you had, a, had someone die last year, then you're subject to the old rules and your first required distribution is this year. But anything this year and beyond, you simply have 10 years to get it all out. And I caution people because the penalty is 50% if you fail to take a required distribution. And when you have a 10 year undefined required distributions, what if you go 10 years and forget it's been 10 years? Think it was only the ninth year and you had a $500,000 IRA and you failed to take it all out within the 10 year period, is the penalty $250,000? And the honest answer to that is, that's the way the rules work. I don't know what kind of leniency uh, the IRS will have or if they come out with a different set of rules, but understand that is a big fear of mine. 10 years is a long time and people don't really have a calendar that they're keeping an eye on for 10 years. Um, and so this is why I tell people the second you inherit money, you really have to sit down and create a plan for tax reasons and, and make sure that you have that plan set in motion to get that IRA money out of IRA status over the next 10 years. It's very important. So it's important not only from an investment perspective, uh, choosing the right investments uh, that'll allow you to distribute over the next 10 years, but then also uh, the tax knowledge, which uh, not always easy to find a financial advisor that understands taxation, but a big part of this inheriting IRA money is all about taxation. So find a good advisor that knows what they're doing um, and, and put a plan together. So if you're trying to calculate your own required minimum distribution, we eliminated the 70 and 71 on this chart 
and now it just starts at 72. And so if your first required minimum distribution, if you're 72 at the end of the year, and the value of your money at the beginning of the year was 500,000, then you take 500,000 and you divide it by the divisor 25.6. That's right, it's not a percentage. The percentage ranges from 3.9 all the way up to 15%. But the reality is, is the way it's calculated, it's the value of your money at the beginning of the year and use the divisor next to your age at the end of the year and simply divide how much money you have by that divisor and it tells you what your required distribution is. This is a table that's readily available. Just, uh, um, just Google uniform required minimum distribution table, or certainly you can shoot us an email and we'll, uh, we'll send you a copy of this as well. Um, we've also heard that the IRS, since the change here, is contemplating changing this table. We have not heard word on when or where or how they're gonna change it. So uh, we'll just have to keep an eye on that as things go because uh, we have lawmakers that change laws, but they don't uh, address it with the IRS. So this was a nice little surprise to the IRS, who is the one that administers the required minimum distribution program. So thanks for joining us. That is the down and dirty, uh, quick and easy rules on required minimum distributions, updating you on some of the changes that we've gone through. Uh, it's very important that you have a plan when it comes to this, not only changing your investment strategies to more stable investing, um, because you have to withdraw every year. Stable investing tends to perform better in that atmosphere. You can have more aggressive uh, investing in the rest of your portfolio. But there definitely should be some shifting and, and strategy change as you approach required minimum distributions. And then certainly if and when uh, you ever inherit IRA money, you have got to sit down immediately and have a plan to get that money out within the next 10 years to minimize the amount of taxation on there. So as always, let us know if we can help. Uh, we don't charge for appointments. The nonprofit organization requires we give you at least an hour of our time. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions and help out whenever and wherever that we can. Um, give us a call, shoot us an email. Uh, keep visiting our, our nonprofit website for more classes or, or wherever you're getting this. Uh, we try to produce new ones every week and get them sent out. Thanks for joining us.